Brilliant. Thank you, Emma. So hello. Welcome to GenQA's Focus On webinar in March. We're now continuing our series of molecular pathology focused webinars, considering and discussing the end to end testing pathways. So this is part two, and we're focusing on choosing the right assay. So all of the elements that you need to consider while setting up your testing. And I'm joined today, I'm very pleased to be joined by um, Dr. Helen Schlout from um, Manchester Laboratory, who's a consultant clinical scientist and is going to give her point of view of how to set up the assays. So if we go to the next slide, please. So we're going to start by um, having initial considerations, the need for the test, the cost, and all of the things that you need to think about before you start choosing um, which direction and which equipment that you want to um, in, employ and um, purchase. What's your starting material? What's the right sample type for testing? How are you going to go about doing that with a different range of methodologies that's currently available? And what then is actually required for implementation? And then as with all of our Focus On webinars, we'll have, invite you to um, submit questions and we'll have a live Q&A session at the end of the slides. So if you would like to submit some questions, either for GenQA or for Helen, then please put them in the questions function that hopefully you can see on your screen. So if we just move on to the next slide, please, Emma. So I'm um, Professor Sandy Deans. I'm Director of GenQA and have great pleasure in, as I say, introducing my colleague, Helen, who is the lead clinical scientist for solid tumours at the Northwest Genomic Laboratory Hub based in Manchester. So Helen, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as Sandy's given a brief introduction to what I'll be covering today. Um, so next slide, please. So there are a number of things that you want to look into and consider before you even start consider looking at which test and which technology um, that you might use for um, introducing a new diagnostic test into a laboratory. First of all is what are your user requirements? What is the disease type or marker that's being of interest? Um, what's the volume expected per year? So how many cases might be coming in? What type of material are you going to be looking at? Is there capacity in the um, staff and in the um, technical aspects of the laboratory. We also need to consider some of the ethical and legal and social impacts of introducing the test. Is it fully understood what the impact of the results might be? You need to consider what the usefulness, the clinical utility of the test would be. Is it suitable and reliable? And is it the likelihood that the test um, would lead to um, an improved outcome? Is it going to impact diagnosis, prognosis or treatment? There are many things that test results can have an impact on. We need to look at the clinical validity of the test and we need to look at whether it's accurate whether the test that you do will give an accurate, accurate prediction of the phenotype or an accurate prediction of response um, to certain treatment. Um, it would need to reflect whether it's clinically sensitive and clinically specific and also consider things like penetrance, particularly in um, inherited disorders, what's the penetrance of the gene and also the expression levels of certain genes and how that might have impacts. And so does the test actually mean something. You need to consider the clinical turnaround time. In what time frame it does the patient need that result for the result to be um, acted upon in a clinically useful time frame? And does it fit within the current clinical pathways that are already in place for patient management? You need to look at the genomic target and the characterization of it, what's known of it, what mutation spectrum is available, for, is known in that gene or um, region um, and, and that will have a big impact on what technology type you might use and naturally we always have to consider the cost we haven't got an endless amount of money so how much would it cost to run this type of tests and does that fit within the remat and fit with the impact it's um, potentially going to have next slide please so once you've got all the background information of the test you're trying to run, um, there are a number of um, considerations around the technology that you'd be considering and looking at. So from um, the technology point of view, you need to be looking at um, the results that it gives now and one of the key, uh, some key measurements that you can look at. So the first is um, trueness. So this is how close the results 
reflect and are to a true to a reference value. So if you ran the test multiple times, you'd have an average of that result and what it means. And what is the variation from that average? Do you get any outliers? What is the average and um, does it fit each time? with giving you the same result and it's similar to precision and all linked so precision is the actual how much it varies so this is often expressed as a clinical um, a confidence interval um, from your mean so you need to understand the full range of results and what they mean you obviously need to understand your sensitivity of your test and this is um, around um, false negatives so if you get a result does that mean that that patient, that result actually um, fits? So if, um, sorry, <laughs> bear with me a minute. So with 100% sensitivity, you would detect all patients that have that disease. But if it's not 100%, then you potentially are going to miss patients with the disease because you can't detect their variant or mutation. So it's what's the risk of a false positive. And this, on the contrary, you've got your specificity. So what's the risk that if you click, if you pick up a variant, the patient has the disease or doesn't have the disease? So how many patients without a phenotype, without the disease also would actually show this mutation or this change? And that's your risk of false positives. What proportion of the patients you test are actually giving a false positive result? And that's combined together, those give you an overall accuracy of the test. So a true understanding of the, the actual impact of the result and does that result actually completely correspond with the patient's um, phenotype or response to a drug. The other important key measurement is your limit of detection. Often seen something similar to your sensitivity, but this is the lowest level that your test is validated to or measured down to. So if you're looking at low levels of biomarkers or trying to detect um, variants in a high background, what is that lowest level where you can be sure that if the variant is not there, it truly isn't there because you've looked at it to a low enough level, rather than your limit of detection maybe being a bit higher and your variant not being detected, but it is actually there, but just at a level below your limit of detection. And those are really um, becoming really key in, in information and measurements when we're starting to push the boundaries of technology and look at truly really low, low sensitive levels and looking for biomarkers that are really at low levels. Next slide, please. Two other key measurements when you're validating and introducing tests into your lab are ones that we're probably all a bit more familiar with. These are the repeatability. So can you repeat it multiple times and get the same results every time? And this is using all the same conditions each time. So the same user running it multiple times, getting the same result. Reproducibility, again, very similar, but this is if you change a variable, if you have a different operator, if you do it on a different day, if you run it on the same machine, but a different, the same model of machine, but a different machine, is it reproducible? Do you get the same results when your process is the same, but there are some variability in there? And then ruggedness, so does it work every time? Or do you get a very, very high failure rate? Is it reliable that you, when you run it, you are going to get a result? And then we also have to consider measurement of uncertainty. This allows the lab to understand the best measurement, so whether the result is truly reflective of what its true value should be. So this takes into account all variables um, that are impacting that test. So it looks at all sources of variation in a given assay and gives an idea of if there is a variable or whether you know that the result you test is going to be a true reflection every time you do it. So next slide, please. So those are some of the considerations around the technology. Obviously, before you um, consider, as well as considering all the variabilities and how to validate a test, you need to consider what you're going to put in. And this comes um, starts looking at sample type. So obviously we need to look at whether we're looking at DNA or RNA, usually in the genomics area, or potentially protein. Majority of what we do is DNA and RNA. But where's that DNA and RNA coming from and how that is going to impact your downstream processing? 
I've listed some of the main sample types we work with for genomics. So we look at formal and fixed material. We looked at fresh frozen tissue, often in the form of tumours. We can look at plasma when we're looking for circulating material and often whole blood. And as I say, we can be extracting DNA or RNA from any of these sample types. Next slide, please. So just picking up on a couple of those tumour types and some of the um, challenges that they present and how we might have considerations we may have to take to get around some of those challenges. When working with um, tumour testing, um, whilst formal and fixed material isn't always the best, most optimised for genomic analysis, it is the most um, it is the best way of preserving the tissue and it is, this for, it is how most of our tumour material is stored. So it is what is available, readily available. The formal infixation process that happens when fresh tissue is taken preserves the tissue structure really well, which is very good for histopathology and protein staining. However, it cross-links the DNA to other DNA and proteins. And when you come to extracting that DNA, you have to break those cross-links. And this then can go on to damage the DNA. Next slide, please. That damage can take a number of different forms. You can get some just single strand breaks, double strand breaks, you get oxidization of bases, um, you get some cross-linking, and most of the damage just results in a unanalyzable fragment of material that you can't get a result from. So you get a quite higher failure rate in FFPT material. But some of that damage, such as deamination of DNA, leads to actual changes of the bases. So what looked like one base has changed to another base. And when we're looking at sensitive sequencing, this can cause problems because it can be difficult to differentiate between an artifact caused by this deamination process and a, and a, a true change, which is causing a, um, an effect on the protein or the gene effect um, in the gene function. Next slide, please. So there are some things that you can do to help um, with the sample type and help increase your success rates with genomics. So there are some published best practice around formal infixation of tissue, around keeping it to a time limited time, so a rapid controlled fixation time, using fresh 4% neutral buffered formalin, and cutting the sections freshly when you need to go to need to do genomic analysis rather than using maybe slide mounted sections that have been hanging around for quite a while. Um, obviously, these factors have been taken into account, and now the majority of pathology samples are fixed in a much more sensitive way for genomic analysis but when you're looking at older archived samples often they have not been treated in quite the same way and so they do have some challenges um, for downstream genomic analysis. Next slide please. Another tissue type that can often present challenges is circulating tumor particularly circulating tumour DNA, which is something that's becoming more and more useful as a biomarker and for using for looking at patients with different cancer types who maybe aren't able to undergo a biopsy or if you want to try and get an answer for treatment very early in the process before the tissue has been sampled and analysed. So the tumor, the tumor cells are circulating in the blood, and if you ex separate the plasma fraction, you do find these circulating tumor material, this free DNA that you are able to extract and then test. However, it is in a background of normal DNA material within that um, plasma fraction. Therefore, your tests and your technology have to take into account that potentially this circulating DNA is at a very, very low level in a higher background of other DNA. Next slide, please. So next, we've looked at our sample type. We've looked at all the parameters we'd need to look at for our technology. Um, I suppose the next key one is what's the actual genomic change you're looking at? We all know um, there are multiple different types of variation. So we have small nucleotide variants. Um, if, sorry, if you could click through, there's a few um, animations on this slide. We've got single base changes. We've got small base paint changes of up to a few, up to about 50 base pairs. Next one. Um, so we know there are hundreds of thousands of these small scale variants in any genome. And these are classes anything below 50 base pairs. Next slide. <clears throat> 
And we also have the larger structural variations. So these can be anything from copy number changes. We can have large deletions, um, disrupting genes, taking out multiple genes, taking part of genes out. We can also have amplifications, which um, impact the um, expression and the protein um, function of certain genes. We get translocation and movement of material between chromosomes and between genes, which can even result can e even can result in um, disruption of the gene and loss of pro fun protein function, but can also lead to the um, result res can also result in oncogenic fusions, where you fuse two different genes together and they actually create a, an enhanced function of the gene. And we also get inversions and many other different types of rearrangements that can have different impacts. And these can all need to be considered differently when you're looking at your technology and what it actually picks up, as well as what your sample input is going to be. Next slide, please. So um, we're very lucky in our um, genomic laboratory hubs to have many different um, technologies available to us. This is just an example of some of the molecular pathology tech techniques and machines that we have. We have anything from um, quite high throughput next generation sequencing machines. We have some more specific targeted machines looking at small runs of DNA like pyrosequencing um, or looking at things like digital PCR, which is very, very specific, but can be incredibly sensitive, have very, very low limits of detection. Um, but then we have um, techniques for looking at larger, more structural variations such as fish and also microarrays. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So which technology are going to use? We've considered all the measurements and parameters we're going to have to look at. We've considered um, what the mutation is and what it, whether it's single nucleotide variants and whether it's a structural variant. We've had to consider what our sample type input will be. Will it be DNA? Will it be RNA? And then we want to look at actually the balance of um, sensitivity versus loss of um, limit of detection. So many of our techniques, um, when we increase the amount of um, genes or gene material that we're looking at, we often um, compromise a little bit on the limit of detection. For example, something like Sanger sequencing or pyro sequencing, we can look at reasonable stretches of um, DNA and analyze the mutations there so we can look at multiple small mutations at a time. <clears throat> but they have higher limits of detection. We can sometimes only go down to 10 or 15 percent um, levels of the variant and detect it reliably. We have other um, technologies such as more specific things like real-time PCR and digital PCR, and they've got incredibly low limits of detection. You can go down below 1% um, allele fractions. However, they can only usually look at one or two small variants at any one time. The introduction of next generation sequencing and obviously the expansion of next generation sequencing has really advanced the methodology and the technology we can use as this allows us to look at large numbers of mutations, um, many, many genes. We can also look at start looking at structural variations and copy number as well, but we still get a relatively low limit of detection. Depending on the amount of sequencing we invest and in, um, the read depth that we um, get from our gene coverage and our sequencing, we can go down to 4%, 2% and down even lower than that when we're looking at really large amounts of sequencing depth in some of these genes. And as I say, we can start looking at DNA and RNA and looking at fusions as well as small nucleotide variants. Next slide, please. So these are just an example of a couple of the technologies in a little bit more detail and why we might choose them over another one. The first one is uh, pyrosequencing, which is a nice technology in chemistry, which allows you to sequence short strands of, um, of material of DNA, um, but it also allows you to do it in a semi-quantitative way which is very useful. It also allows you to detect methylation patterns um, in those short stretches. You can target known sites which are methylated and look at the level of methylation there. It's relatively quick and relatively cheap to run 
and it can be validated down to a pretty sen a, a pretty good sensitivity. We can detect things down at about 5% variable allele frequency. So it's very good for short sequences of DNA, so hotspot regions where you need to have quite a good sensitivity and you want to run quite a rapid cheap, cheap um, assay. Next slide, please. We've got digital droplet PCR. Again, this is a more targeted assay where it actually looks at each individual copy of DNA. And by running this and using statistics and proportions of hundreds of thousands of droplets, you can give a really good um, quantitative estimate of how much material and what your target and what your mutation levels are. Because it uses the statistics and it goes down to single copy analysis, um, you can go incredibly low and um, it can be validated down as low as 0.01%. It equally doesn't require much DNA input. So if you've got very small amounts of material inputting, it's a good option. So it's ideal for things like ctDNA. However, you can only look at a very small number of regions. You need a different design for each different small change and each different variant. So it's quite labor intensive for what it's um, for the amount of information it gives. Next slide, please. On to next generation sequencing, which is now what is used for a huge amount of the um, genomic analysis done in laboratories now. This gives you a huge variety and range of um, options. You can look at multiple targets from a few genes, five genes, up to well over 500 genes. We're looking at whole exomes and whole genomes. We can look at small nucleotide variants, copy numbers and structural variants, both at the DNA level and at the RNA input. As I said, it can be very, very sensitive just by doing more sequencing. So putting less samples on or putting less genes, but still coverage, still getting the same amount of sequencing material off it, you can get very, very sensitive um, detection down below 1%. It can be relatively high throughput. Some of the larger next generation sequencing machines now allow you to analyze multiple patients for hundreds of genes all at the same time. And when you start looking at high throughput um, sequencing of patients, you start to bring the cost down. It becomes quite um, cost effective to run these platforms. However, it produces a huge amount of DNA, a huge amount of data which has to be managed and that data analysis can be quite complex. So you need advanced bioinformatics processing and um, skills to allow you to look at that data. And then there's a lot of data that comes out at the end that then needs analysing in the context of the patient to allow you to report it. Next slide, please. Another option we have is DNA methylation arrays. These actually allow you to give you a more genome-wide view, but looks at the methylation patterns. And methylation is coming increasingly important and interesting in genomics and understanding how disease and treatment patterns and um, molecular pathology assays work and how they respond to different treatments. So you can look at large regions of the genome, you can look at the balance of methylation, whether it's increased or decreased. It also allows you to look at the larger structural changes and the copy number variation. However, these arrays, running the arrays, can be relatively labor intensive and they are generally of, on a higher end of the cost scale. They also need a relatively higher DNA input um, to get good results from. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, we now are able to do whole genome sequencing, which gives us a vast amount of data that we can look at from structural variants, um, small, vari small nucleotide variants, structural variants. We can analyze and look at acquired somatic variants at the same time as looking at germline inherited changes. And we can give it, have a much more global view of the genome as a whole and what's happening. And we can start looking at mutation signatures such as homologous recombination or mismatch repair rather than looking at specific genes. Next slide, please. So when you've chosen your technology and you've chosen your assay and you know what you want to run, part of that key part of that validation and optimization will be looking at the thresholds of acceptance. We need to understand what quality metrics the um, assay has and what um, indicates a good quality run or a poor quality run and where those thresholds lie for failure of a sample. 
we need to understand the thresholds of acceptance who call a, a positive result and a, a negative result. This becomes much more important when you start looking at um, instead of the presence or absence of a single change, you're looking at a scale of how much change there is. So how much amplification is present or how much loss and what that level is in the background. And then when you start looking at tumor material, which is often a mixed population of tumor cells, and normal material, we're having to balance what the level of tumor is with that level of copy number variation detected by the assay and then balance that with what your threshold would be to call a true positive and a true negative and bioinformatics and informatics um, becomes incredibly important in analysing all this material and um, on all this data and being able to give a true reflection of the result um, from that technology. Next slide, please. And finally, if you've completed your technology validation, you know um, how it's going to run your material and what assay you're going to run and it's been fully optimised. Um, the final kind of bit to close the loop and allow you to run the test in a diagnostic laboratory is full documentation of that validation and optimization. So you understand why it's being run as it is. A final SOP, which um, details the technical aspects of the test, how the service will be managed, how the samples are triaged as they come in, and then information on how to, and an SOP on how to analyze and report that data um, to give the best result possible for the patient. You need to have examples of training records so that you know that patients and um, that staff are competent to run and analyze the material and um, a program of competence and audit to check that staffing and that education and training. Um, we have and set up EQAs, um, partake in any EQA schemes available to ensure you've got ongoing consistency and quality in delivering that service. And where there's no EKAs um, present, you might want to be involved in some pilot EQAs or sample um, um, sample swaps with other laboratories to try and make sure you've got some kind of external quality assurance as well. And finally, all this comes together to um, work towards an accreditation of the test within the laboratory um, so that it comes within our scope of accreditation um, to meet certain standards. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Helene. That's a fantastic um, presentation, just bringing together all the different things that you need to think about and also a really nice go to place for all a description of the methods and the pros and cons. So thank you very much indeed. And um, please, those of you on the call, if you want to ask any questions, please put them in the, the questions box and we'll get to them. Um, but there's a couple coming in already, Helen, if you don't mind. One is you talked about using formalin and how that's sort of the optimal approach for pathology and cellular pathology techniques. But we know that there's other alternative fixatives out there. Have you heard about them? Have you tried them? What's the your thoughts? We know there's been some work on alternative fixatives um, and some quite promising work. I know there's been a little bit of work at looking at alternative fixatives, particularly for whole genome sequencing, which currently can only be done on fresh tissue. Um, and some of it is, is promising, but um, it's quite hard to amass the amount of information you'd need. Um, and then alongside whilst you can have the experimental evidence to show that the fixative is fine and it doesn't impact the downstream genomics it's then considering how you would actually go about implementing that change and using that fixative in systems that are so embedded in using a current system of formalin bringing new fixatives into those pathways can be equally challenging so there's an a wide range of things that need considering when you're looking at alternative fixatives as well as just the impact of the fixative on the tissue. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's not just genomics working in isolation, is it? It's very much as part of no. the, the whole patient pathway. Thank you. That's great. Um, another one's coming around um, long read sequencing. I think everybody's hearing about the, the pros and cons of long read sequencing. How does that work? How is that different maybe to the audience of from what we know as sequencing? 
Yeah, in long reads, interest, really interesting, and there's more and more information and data coming out of the long read sequencing platforms and understanding how they compare and how they could be used and implemented into diagnostics. So, long read sequencing, you generally need a lower DNA input, um, and it's seems to work on multiple different tumour types or uh, material sample inputs that I, from what I understand, um, it can be very, very quick. There are options of running it in quite low throughput, small laboratories, as well as running it more high throughput. And what it can give you is more um, contextual structural information because it's reading the material in one go rather than using it in a fragmented way. It can often give you lots of different lots of information where you currently would have to run multiple tests. For example, it can give you structural variants and small nucleotide variants all in one assay, as well as then giving you methylation information. So for some surfaces and some areas, particularly things like neurological tumours, where they have broad range of structural changes and as well as small variants and methylation having different impacts and being really important to both the prognosis and the treatment and the diagnosis if you could get all that information from one test it can be really quite useful and powerful i think there's still work to do on the um the trueness and the validity and how well and how um, accurate the long read sequencing is, as it's not always been as accurate as some of the shorter read next generation sequencing. Um, and then there's, you know, obviously work to do with implementing pathways and how you would implement a service and technology like that and handle the data. Again, you get huge amounts of data off long read sequencing that needs careful bioinformatic analysis. Great, thank you. So maybe watch the space for it coming into the clinical. I think so, very much so. It's on it's on its way. Thank you. Um, another question, something else about new technique, circulating tumour DNA, and you mentioned that was one of the sample types. Is that being used clinically? And somebody's saying, what tumour types can it be used for? Yes, yeah, so circulating tumour is another area that's vastly expanding currently. Up until now, it has been available clinically for only for a very limited number of um, mutations and tests. It's been available for certain targeted resistance mutations in lung cancer, um, but at very low levels using really targeted um, technologies such as DDPCR. What's coming now is um, particularly initially, I think the first large scale ctDNA testing that's going to be available in genomics labs is for lung cancer, allowing you to look at a broad range of genes and fusions and single nucleotide variants, um, but very, very early on in the lung cancer patient's pathway. Often with lung cancer, by the time the patient's had a biopsy, had it assessed, then had genomic material, the patient's progressed and they're already quite poorly, or they've needed the answer to start that treatment sooner. The ctDNA um, option allows you to take that blood sample very early in the pathway with any suspected lung cancer and get that key information for treatment. There's lots of targetable treatments out there if you can get the genomic material information um, and results very early in the pathway. So we're, we're likely to see that coming very soon. And then I think there are other tumour types which will follow soon after somewhere tissue is just really hard to get hold of and others where it's really important because the mutations on the targets for treatment that they're looking at, uh, it's better to look at it in a ctDNA rather than in a tissue. Okay, thank you. So a real clinical need there, isn't it? It's very obvious why it's important. Thank you. Um, I think we've come to the end of our questions, unless there's any others pop in. No? Okay, thank you. So Helen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, and if we go on to the next slide, just to say that um, we really do appreciate any feedback um, and you will be sent a survey after this um, webinar and it really is to see if we're hitting the spot or if there's any other topics that you would like us to cover. Um, you will also be able to access this webinar. We've recorded it through a new link um, and you'll get a participation certificate for those of you who have joined as well. We'll continue with our molecular pathology and um, end-to-end testing webinars with the next um, focus on webinar being held in April, and that's around reporting the data. So we've talked today about how you do the testing. The next one is about how you report that information. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Helen, once again, and thank you, Emma and Jenny, for facilitating the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.